Hi everyone, my name is Declan McGlynn. Welcome to Friday Forum Live, Point Blank's weekly broadcast bringing you exclusive tutorials, artist interviews and industry insight every Friday live from East London. Today we're joined by Point Blank instructor Ganesh Singerhem, who will be looking at five ways to get bigger drums. So today I'm joined by Ganesh, who's worked with the likes of Pharrell, Kanye West and Swedish House Mafia. And we're going to look at how to get bigger drums with tips on EQ, compression and much more. If you want to study with Ganesh and learn more about mixing, sound engineering and mastering, check out our Master Diploma course here in London at www.pointblanklondon.com. And remember, we are absolutely live and interactive, so get your questions in the chat and we'll get to them throughout the broadcast. Ganesh, welcome. Friday Forum Live, your first time. Uh, that's my first. Don't yeah. get nervous. Yeah, no. It's good, good sort of being here. Don't yeah, we? yeah. It's great to have you. So the drums, I mean, we were just talking before we went on uh, about the importance of drum sound, how the drum sound can make or break a mix in any genre, really. Yeah. Uh, would yeah. you agree with that? I think so. Like, if your drums are the driving force of the track and they're sort of lacking that energy to drive it and give it that boost, then you're sort of selling the track a little bit short. Yeah. So Absolutely. obviously, you know, you do jazz to electronic to rock. There's all different styles of working with it. But, you know, I think it's a big part to sort of get, get right. And to be honest, I think a lot of people struggle a little bit with getting a nice sound. Mm. So, you know, like today, we're just going to do a quick five tip trick and sort of see what we can get out of it. And nice one. it'll be a massive difference, you know, just simple things that you can try. Yeah, cool. So what's, I mean, there's so many aspects to drums, not just from the different timbres across the different toms and snares and kick and cymbals, but also the EQ and compression. I mean, where do you start? What's your approach? I see, I just judge the sound for what it is and see what I'm going to try to bring out of it. If there's frequencies that are pushing in certain spots that might interact too much with the bass or vocal or whatnot, I need to start attenuating that stuff first. So it's almost like finding pockets and how you're going to put it together. So if you have frequency on frequency like that, suddenly it's all fighting for that space. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you spread it apart a bit, they start breathing and working a bit more. So that's why a lot of mixes, I think, sometimes can be muddy and cloudy because of that sort of fight for that constant like sort of frequency band that's pushing there. Yeah. So I think, yeah, just sort of see what the sound is and then how to make it better as well. You don't necessarily have to EQ everything, but you know, if you need to, that's a good tool that we have at our disposal. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So shall we take a look at the project? I mean, yeah. what's this project you brought today? Uh, so this is a song that I recorded and mixed with some uh, students from Point Blank. So it's a rock song, um, but the thing is, you know, whatever concepts that we go through today, you can apply it to any genre. Mm -hmm. So. I'm going to go through more concepts. I know this is a rock example, but you can tailor it to hip hop, to electronic. So we'll sort of keep it a little bit broad cool. in a way. Yeah. Um, I'll start off by my awesome diagram. I think I'm <laughs> such a terrific drawer. I don't know if you can get that in pretty close. I think this is a visual aid for EQing. You know, see where the speaker is and how it's divided up. I know there's a lot more sort of categories in this, but the basics of it. So in terms of sub, when you look at it, I think it's important to try to figure out and imagine where you want your sub to be and what else is sort of around there. So usually what's down there, it's your kick and bass, mm. sort of occupying that range. So really, realistically, you know, hi-hats don't really belong down there. They belong a little bit higher up. So you just sort of figure out where you need to place things. So I like to sort of imagine it as, you know, my sub's down here, my low end's here, my mid and highs are up there. So when you start mixing, you can almost fill out a song so it feels complete. You know, when mixers are lacking some low end or mids, you find that there's a lot of pockets in the mix. Yeah. So when you try to EQ something or try to piece together a song with all the elements, try to fit it in this sort of box in a way. So it's tonally balanced. Yeah, it helps to visualize it that way. Yeah, it? like, you know, I'm more visual than anything, so I need sort of some guidance. So, you know, if you have this just in front of you and you're mixing and you sort of Balancing your mixes, simple, quick trick. It's, your drawing is probably better than mine. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's just quick little tricks that you can do. Yeah. So when we go through it and we bake down like a kick and snare, we sort of go through these different sections. Um, 
you know, EQing is a big thing from plug-in to plug-in and using analog gear and stuff like that. So I could boost, say, 120 hertz, for example, for a kick drum on a SSL EQ and then do it on an API EQ, do it on a Logic EQ, do it on know, another EQ. They will all sound different because mm. EQs, you know, besides boosting and cutting stuff, they actually can tonally shape a sound. So, you know, you might pick an EQ that deals with, you know, the low end punch a little bit better, but the sub frequencies, you might pick a different EQ. This is all just learning your tools that you have at your disposal. Yeah. So it's all going back to ear training and stuff like that. Yeah, and there's more of that on the course than sound engineering. Yeah, yeah, course, definitely. Yeah. It's a big topic, so we're trying to condense a little yeah. bit down now today. Um, one thing I'll just go through, I guess, is EQ and kick drum. So I'll just break it up into the sections again. I'll just say a lot of different sort of numbers. Don't boost them all, but just see what works for your kick drum. Because I've just done a lot of records and I find these frequencies are really good go to. So sub frequencies, we're sort of dealing with like 50 hertz, 60, 70, 80. Low end, so that's your low end like punch example. Yeah. You're dealing more with like 120 hertz, 150 hertz. Uh, the mid frequencies, which can be a little bit muddy, um, you can almost cut out like 300, 330 and 500, so that's cutting all that. It'll almost make your kick drum tighter and suck a little bit of the air out, so it's a nice tight, punchy sort of kick. Yep. And the high end, uh, high end is very important for kick drum, so you need to make sure you're boosting that high end attack, so it's that, yep. that sound as opposed to like the thud sort of thing. That high end boost will make it cut through on a lot of different systems. So you're almost dealing with like 2.5K, uh, 3K and about 4K. Right. So a lot of different numbers, but just try them out and see what works for your kick drum. Yeah. I've just said a lot of numbers there, but they all somehow suit. So just pick which one works for your kick. And yeah. obviously put it in context, because yeah. if something sounds awesome in solo, you put it in the mix, go, oh, where, the, where the hell did it go? Yeah, exactly. But um, I've got a kick drum here. So this is without any EQ, so let's have a quick listen. So it's an acoustic crit, obviously you hear the spill. What I'm going to do is add my EQ on. So I've boosted around 122 hertz just for punch. I've cut out a bit of the 500 just to make it a lot more tighter. And I'm boosting around 3.5 for this kick drum, just to make it sort of attack a little bit more. So let's have a listen with it on. Might have to go a little bit more dramatic with the EQs, just so you can hear it. So once again, when you listen to it, try to break it down in the speaker, you know, from the low end, sub, top end, and all that sort of stuff. Without and with. So if you can't hear the EQ changes too much, I mean just go nuts with the EQ so you can really feel it and then back it off. Right. This is all about ear training as well. Um, but instantly, you know, we've got a lot more attack happening up top. We've got a bit of the punch and a tighter kick drum sound. Mm. When you're EQing uh, kick drums, do you pay attention to things like the key of the track in terms of what you boost in the low end? Uh, some people do, but yeah. Yeah, me, I'm just a lot about feel. Right. Um, I'll know if something sounds off, Yeah. but when I mix, it's I don't get too caught up in technical things. I guess because subconsciously I know all of it, but I just go a lot more about the feel of it. Right. Um, if I notice something is poking out more, then yeah, you have to yeah. get attend to that. Yeah. Um, and you also notice on this, I've actually EQ'd the sub out. The reason why it's one of the steps later, I'm going to show you how to create like a big sub kick that'll just rattle floors and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So everyone wants to Excellent. do that, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's one thing. So I'm just going to quickly do it on another EQ, the SSL EQ by Waves. Once again, different tone, different flavor. So I'm boosting around similar frequencies, sorry, about 120 hertz, cutting out a bit of the 500 and adding a bit more of the attack. And make sure you turn the analog off because that's like white hiss. So that's the caution. Without. So once again, focus low, 
mid highs. So not too sure if you can hear that properly, but just make sure if you're not hearing it or feeling it, just push it a lot more so you can actually notice and recognize the sound and then go back from mm -hmm. there. Um, so that's some basic stuff for a kick in terms of EQing. Obviously, once we get the compressors and parallels and all the good stuff, in there, yeah. it takes it to that next level. But for now, basic tools is just EQing. Yeah. Uh, the snare drum. So if we were to go back to the snare, so this is a snare by itself. So just quickly with a snare, if we were going back here, obviously I don't need too much sub from it. So I'm going more low end punch, so I want to really feel that hit. You're almost boosting like about 100 hertz, if depending on the snare, 180, 200 hertz. If you want a bit more sort of higher end, or higher lows, I guess, um, thickness, you're almost boosting like uh, 400 hertz. Once again, if you want to tighten up the snare, you can cut a bit of that 330 or like uh, 500 hertz out. It just mm. gives you a tighter snare sound. And if you want high-end crack of a snare, so you get that real <laughs> snap, because you know a lot of records you want that sort of stuff. You're almost boosting like, like 2.5K, and you can almost try like 10K as well. They both add different sort of crack qualities. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, all right. <laughs> let's, not like that, <laughs> let's not go down that path, eh? Um, but yeah, so it's just two different types of tones that you want to yeah, go yeah. for. Sometimes I do both. Sometimes I might just do one. So it just depends on the song. Um, but let's have a quick uh, listen to the differences. So in this instance, I just found 160 hertz. I thought it worked well. Cutting out a bit of 500. Uh, boosting 2.6 and around about 10k. So once again, just try to listen to it in well, where it lies in the speaker. That almost gives it a lot more life, especially in the top end, the energy yeah. of it. And, you know, I can roll off some of the bottom end just to make it tighter as well. So just some frequencies that, you know, will help you get that kick drum or snare sort of popping out a lot more. If you want to tighten it up, you know, there's frequencies there that will help you out mm -hmm. as well. Um, also, it's all about feel, you know, we're doing it in solo mode, but we need to see how it works in the track. So if I'm boosting 10K here, I'm only doing it by, you know, not too much. What's that? 4.5 dB. If I need to go, you know, 6, 10 dB, it sounds weird in solo, but that's not the point. No one's just listening to the snare. Yeah. You need to listen to it in context with everything. It might work there. It might not work in solo, but, you know, that's another story. Um, the next big thing, I think, is compression. Yes. Uh, obviously... The last art. Yeah, I know. It's <laughs> Some of those things that, you know, is so people really struggle with at first. You must find that with students just getting their head around. Yeah, yeah. Because it's got that so. kind of mystical quality. People talk about compression like it's going to solve all your problems. Yeah, it is yeah. such a big thing. Like I thought I was compressing things right and then I worked in a studio and then the guy that I was working with was going, what are you doing that for? It's like, that sounds awesome, I love it. He goes, try it this way. And then it just came out. It's like, what did you do there? And I started understanding it a bit more. And it is, yeah. it is a complicated topic because it's such a musical tool. You know, a lot of people think that compressors are just for, like, you know, dynamic control. It's not really just that, you know. You can actually shape a sound with the start and end of it. You can tonally shape how someone's played something. You know, if someone's played it a little bit too aggressive, like an acoustic guitar, but it's meant to be for, like, a jazz sort of song, you can almost chill them out a little bit with a compressor. Mm. So you can alter someone's performance. You can also alter the feel and timing of something as well. But obviously it's very big sort of topic, but yeah. we don't have time for that, but yeah. at Point Blank we do. Um, it's just, with the attack and release, I think, it's the main thing that we'll focus on today, just to make your kick drums pop through. Mm. I think, you know, if I was to visually do this as well, if I've got, 
you know, my compressor set up, and that's my kick drum. As soon as the compressor gets the kick drum, it reacts in a certain way. So this goes to your attack times. Yeah. So a slow attack will allow the kick drum to go through and then compress. So it allows the front of it to go through. So that way you get your attack, your punch. If it was on a quick attack, as soon as it goes in, the compressor grabs it and it almost shaves off the front of the sound. So depending on the style and what you're trying to do with the compressor, you can almost fix that first transient to suit the song. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people think that when they do kick drums, it's a quick attack. It's actually a slow attack, it's opposite to what you normally would think. Uh, and same thing with release, you know. As soon as the kick drum goes in, compressor's in action, as soon as it leaves, release is about how quickly it gets back to starting point. If the kick drum's in, out, but the compressor's still in play, then you're almost over-compressing it. It doesn't have a chance to get back ready for the next mm. kick. So you can almost tailor the tail of a sound as well. I'll just show you an example with the kick drum. I'm going to go extreme with it so you can really hear it. Oh, that's a bit different. Yeah, the new Logic 10.1 compressor is there. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Nice. Um, all right, so let's check this out. I'm just going to move my SSO up there because I've just shaped it with my EQ and now I'm going to just hit it hard with a compressor. So let's just play it and we'll work on our settings quickly. Oh, I think it's soloed on the snare rather than uh, the kick. <laughs> don't you like having it here? <laughs> That'll help, I think. So I'm just picking a vintage FET, just for the aggression, or you could go studio FET. It's just about the aggression, because for drums I think the FETs are really good. So I'm just going to mess with the attack right now. So that's slow, and then quick. You need to just focus on the start of the sound right now, not too much on the tail. And then let me go back the other way. Just allows the front through. Same thing for the tail. I'll go extreme again with this. So this is very quick. And you can almost see the needle reacting with the kick drum. It's following, as opposed to that. See how it's always in the compression mode? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have time to react. So you need to think what you're trying to compress. Obviously, kick and snares, we want that to be pretty beefy, right? So, before, straight away you can hear the punch. Yeah. So, before, and after. Obviously, you know, make it work to what you want. Ratio is obviously going to define it more as well as your threshold of where you want to start compressing. Okay, so snare, just quickly again. I might go studio FET, just a little bit more aggression. I think the vintage is a little bit duller, duller in a way. Let's turn it on. Straight away, you can feel the difference. Yeah, the, the attack is much stronger and popular. Yeah. yeah. Would you always recommend allowing things to return to zero before they're compressed again, especially with drums? It depends. Like, you know, acoustic kits, obviously there's a lot of spill happening. Yeah. What I can do is almost, rather than using a transient designer to sort of suck in the end of it, so I don't hear too much of the spill, I can just increase my release time so it's almost like holding it a little bit more before it lets go. So it's like shapes, shapes are like that rather than like mm. that. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on the sound, yeah. Like obviously you'd compress bass a lot differently. If it's yeah. long sustained notes, you have to work your attack and release. Mm -hmm. Same thing like MCs, you know, very percussive as opposed to like an opera singer. So you need to work your uh, compressor in that way. Yeah. Um, and if you're trying to really compare like A, B, your compression without compression, I would match up the levels, make up gain, and just 
turn it on and off so it's the same level and really yeah. focus on the attack and release. Yeah, a lot of the time the actual volume is the thing that you get yeah. excited about. Louder think, is better, oh, right? Yeah, yeah, you think the compressor <laughs> yeah, yeah. is better yeah. because it's louder. So yeah, it's really important to AB it at the same level. Yeah. I think it's a good thing because you're training your ears as well. Yeah. You know, because you don't want to have that impression of loud, yeah. I like that, that's so good. But, yeah. Um, yeah, someone's yeah. Ask, actually asking in the comments about what's the difference between all the different types of compressors and when's a good time to use them. But that's probably a longer discussion, yeah, which yeah, we yeah. will look into doing if anybody yeah. else wants to know about that. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. But today yeah. it's all about drums, so. Yeah, big time. Um, should we go on to the sub kick? Yes, definitely. Probably everyone's been wanting to yeah. hear about this one. All right, so let me just un solo the snare. So what I've done for this kick drum is I've just bust it via bus one. Let's turn it on. I've got some settings here. So I'm leaving the low end in for the EQ. I'm gutting all this stuff out because I don't want to reintroduce that sound to my kick drum. Because otherwise, you know, you're sort of colliding a lot in mm -hmm. certain areas. And to be honest, this is a sub kick, so I don't need too much top end information. I just leave that much in just so it feels a little bit natural, so it doesn't sound too boxy. Um, a cool thing is like using a sub harmonic generator. So you could use things like uh, R bass, do it, you can do it on lo fi. You know, I've just used a bass amp setting. Uh, it's a standard Logic plugin, but you have a few things down here which are pretty cool. Uh, heavy bottom, because we were like that, and how low, so how low can you go, so it depends yeah. on the song and the type of sound you want to go for. Haven't tweaked it at all, I've just picked heavy bottom. So what I'm doing is I'm EQing it how I want, and then I'm letting the bass amp with a subharmonic generator tone the sound. So I'm not letting other frequencies sort of change it or give it a different feel. What I do after that is I compress it. The reason why I compress it is because I want a nice tight sort of sub frequency. And you notice on my kick drum, I actually took um, that frequency out. Mm -hmm. Oops, let me add this back in. So what I've done is scoop that out because I want this sub kick to fill in that, gen uh, that little spot. Mm -hmm. And the thing is because I'm compressing it, it's a nice sort of tight bottom end that if you play it on any sort of sp speaker setup or Someone's got a bass boost in their car. Uh, usually people have it at plus two or plus four or whatnot. No matter what happens, this is a nice controlled sub, so it doesn't sort of blow out on any system. So it's wow. a good little sort of tactic. Uh, and let's just have a listen to it. Introduce it. Without. And just sort of figure out where where it needs to be. Obviously don't have it too subby because then it's going to drown out all the other elements. But yeah. you can just sort of mix it in slightly. So that's, it's sort of that simple, you know. You might have to check out phase because sometimes plugins put things out of phase. Yeah, I was going to say the bass amp, amp plugins sometimes do that, yeah. Yeah, so always chuck on a... I think it's a utility gain, mono, you can just phase invert. So just check if it's in phase or out of phase. It's a good trick. Otherwise you're not sort of getting the sub you want if yeah. it's out of phase. Would you recommend always doing, not always, but in a lot of the time using parallel, instead of trying to EQ something to get everything out of one sound, give it a certain tone and then use parallel volume faders yes. to bring it in underneath, yeah, yeah. instead of just trying to make one sound do everything. Yeah, parallels is, I think, a fun part of mixing. Yeah. Uh, it gives the song energy. So you can parallel a lot of things, but you can get a bit crazy with parallels, so you've got to control yourself in a way. But parallels add that energy factor to a song. Yeah. It really brings it to life. So whatever processing that I've got on my individual track, my kick and snare, for example, it's all working together. But then what I'm doing is sending all that information to another track and mixing that energy level in. So I've still got my original, but I'm just paralleling it with another... Mm -hmm. Um, signal. So it can be EQ, it can be distortion, it can be compression. Uh, what we've got today is a parallel just with a standard uh, logic plugin and then I'm going to put a nice UAD one on so you can hear the differences. But let's have a listen to our 
drums first, kick and snare. So that's without any parallel. So I've just got the sub sub kick going on right there. So in this instance, what I'm doing is I'm sending it via bus two. So on bus two, I'm sending it to this track, and on this I've got a compressor on. You can really pick how you want this to be. You can make it aggressive, you can make it a little bit more chilled out, but add a different sort of tone. But what I do with parallels is I usually hit it pretty hard because okay. I want an aggressive sound that I mix in under my other sound. Um, so the settings are here if you want to sort of quickly check it out. Uh, just attack and release. It's not so much like the kick drum, but a little bit different. Let me turn this on from the snare. And let's check it out. Without it. With. Like that's a massive energy. Yeah. Know. I'll just do it one more time without. You know, you can just feel anything, everything a bit more. Everything's got aggression. I know it's louder, but you got to put that in context with the mix as well. Yeah. You know, and speaking of which, can we, can we hear it in context yeah, with the yeah. mix? Maybe if you could okay. turn off all the parallel so we can A, B it in the mix and see the difference it makes. Because yeah. it sounds a lot when it's solo, for sure. Such an energy difference, and I'll just mute both the sub and the parallel. The drums almost sound a bit cute, but let's go a bit more aggressive with it. So yeah, quick yeah. little tips that will help you out. Yeah, can we just hear the UAD plugin as well? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I know it's a fair child, it's one of my favorites. Yeah, man, I love that bad boy too. <laughs> uh, actually, let me do it. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is showing UAD, but really, you know, as we've shown already, native Logic plugins or any plugin Yeah, you can, you can do, do this with whatever, yeah. yeah. It's all tones, you know, they all sound different, so it's just whatever works for the scenario. Um, Okay, I love this bad boy. Should I do it just drums or the whole track? What do you reckon? Whatever you think. You're the expert. Oh. <laughs> bad boys, quite a bit. And then reducing the threshold. Time constant, let's make it quick. Now, I'll just compare yeah. the tones. It's a little bit pokey, and that's a lot more smoother. Definitely, yeah. A little bit more natural sounding for this track. Yeah. But yeah, I love driving this and then backing off the threshold. So it's just overloading the tubes in a way, because it's. Emulating the bad boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Nice one. So there's plenty of questions coming in. We'll try and get through as many as we can. Uh, Joseph Wilk is wondering if you have a standard workflow for setting drum levels, or if you begin a mix setting the kick level and work around that. I sort of, when I get a mix up, it's all about the feel right at the start. You know, I don't worry too much about the kick drum. I sort of listen to the track and figure out where everything needs to be, like panning mm -hmm. levels and stuff like that. So 
you know, before I even touch anything, the mix should feel like it's there almost. And then you go through and start carving it out. So for me personally, I start off with the drums and then I sort of do bass and other main sort of instruments, vocals and get into all that sort of stuff. But I think when you start doing all these tricks, you know, like parallels and stuff like that, maybe try to do it at the start so you've got something to build up upon, you know. Otherwise yeah. you're sort of going back and forth a little bit too much. You can always add another parallel, which is always fun yeah. at the end. Or three. Yeah, or four or five. Uh, yeah, yeah, so um, Robin Gallen's wondering, um, what are the secrets to the Swedish House, Swedish House Mafia drums? Uh, it's a lot of hard compression and samples they use. They've got great sounds to begin with, so mm -hmm. it's just sort of beefing that up a lot more. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so... Did you use, use a lot of parallel? Uh, for that, we were in the studio, so we had a lot of analog gear. But same right. concepts, but different tones and a lot more energy, I guess, you can get out of them. Yeah, for sure. But good, they got good samples and stuff to work with. Um, GCTV asks, would these methods um, be useful with vinyl or sample sounds, or is it more about live recordings? Now, as I said, like you could use those settings that I gave you, the numbers for sub, low, high, crack, and all that. You can use them on any sort of kick drum. Mm -hmm. I've just worked with a lot of acoustic stuff, electronic stuff, and those frequencies are generally the stuff that I go for. So this kick drum might be 50 hertz, but an, another kick drum might be 60 hertz or 80 hertz. You just need to feel what's right for that sound mm -hmm. and then sort of go from there. But that's sort of good guide points to sort of sub, okay, let's try a few of these, see which works. Crack, try up here. Mm. So just some numbers that will hopefully work for a lot of things. Yeah, cool. So um, Anzix, Anzix is asking, how do you go about placing different sounds in your panorama as in space, stereo space. Um, do you have a do you have standard positions for certain drum elements or is it just again about the mix? Uh, I like to pan it like I'm playing the drums because I okay. can't play drums. I like to feel <laughs> like I'm playing just it. Just pretend, yeah. Yeah, just pretend, you know, sort of <laughs> grooving along. But you know, kick and snare obviously dead center. Hi-hat I always pan to the left, because uh, you know, it's usually on the left in the kit. Toms I'd pan around as well. Uh, if I had another percussive element I'd sort of place it around. I like to use my stereo image quite a bit and not have things fighting for the center space. So I just put my core elements there mm -hmm. and everything else is sort of spread. Cool. Um, Andrew Reynoldson is asking, do you ever scale up the compression, i.e. two to one ratio on a kick, uh, two to one compression on the drums bus, as opposed to just four to one? Basically, I guess asking, is there a reason for certain compress uh, compression ratios? Yeah, so it's, it's pretty much to, you know, if I'm shaping a sound in a certain way, how dramatic do I want it? Uh, do I want it, you know, two to, two to one or four to one or keep going like that? So if I want gentle compression, I'm going like two to one. Yeah. As soon as I go like four to one, I'm getting a bit heavier. And when you get to 10 to one, you're sort of moving into a lot more heavy compression. So just how dramatic do I want that? Okay, cool. Um, there was another question quickly, maybe one more. Uh, do you, yeah, so Schizo Boy <laughs> is asking, do you EQ the drum bus or just the individual tracks? So do you have a, a, a separate process for the actual drum bus? I do individual tracks, but, you know, I've done mixes where I've done individual processing, but I needed to glue the drums even more together. So then I'll do a drum bus. But usually my style of mixing, I'll have a more individual, uh, individually spread out, and then I'll just process each one. Right. And then hit it with parallels and yeah. stuff. But I've done situations where I've had to actually route it all via a bus uh, to the drum bus and then I can do overall EQ moves or compression or things like that. Yeah. It's whatever, whatever's easy for you. I mean, like whatever we're talking about with mixing, it's all concepts and you know, how to apply it with your style of music and your flavor. Um, so yeah, just try it out, you know, try it out different sort of setups, see what works for you. Mm. Um, so yeah, we've got time for just one more question from Allegro, who's uh, asking, do you have a scheme for panning drums, especially toms, because they sound panel over left, right normally? We kind of answered that question already. But yeah, you just mean you try and do it as realistically as possible. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not a hard and fast rule by any means. No, I mean, you know, it just depends how you want to sort of yeah, and, showcase and that in the song. sense that if you've got a very pokey mid-range sound somewhere else, you might want to pan something out of the way. Yeah, that's right. So the, the time might end up on the other side. Yeah, yeah. For the sake of EQ. Yeah, exactly. The mixed so, picture as a whole. 
Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. Nothing's fighting for that space there as well, you know. So yeah, yeah. just by painting something a little bit, some it just breathes a lot more. And just try painting things hard left and right at times. You know, sometimes people get a little bit scared. Yeah. It's like, no, just go for it and see, you know. What's the worst that can happen? You just pull it back a bit. So yeah. Just try it out. So yeah, it's a, it's a massive subject and um, I'm sure we'll come back and talk about it again. But yeah, thanks, Ganesh. Thanks, guys. And uh, hopefully you got plenty of inspiration for the weekend. And if you're thirsty for much more about drums, mixing and mastering, you can come study sign engineering with Ganesh right here in London. So you can visit www.pointblanklondon.com to find out more about our Master Diploma. We'll be back next week with another FFL, so we'll see you then. Cheers.